Okay. You guys figure out the mics. We're just picking what, we're just picking what color we want. Okay, we're going to be careful not to trip each other. I'm just going to stand right here. That's probably a good idea. Okay, so hi. Uh, you already heard our names. We're going to uh, talk a little bit about Imagineering. You guys obviously know what Disney is and, and uh, know what we've got here in Florida. A lot of people don't really understand necessarily how Imagineering fits into that or what the different uh, roles are on a day-to-day -day basis, how, it, how the work happens out there. So we're going to give you like a brief overview, uh, kind of our, our somewhat generic WDI presentation that they give us at the office, but I think we're going to give Exciting you Exciting kind of, generic, though. Well, that's what I meant. Kind of a condensed version of that, a little bit less um, formal, a little bit more conversational. And we'll kind of run through that and then have plenty of time for Q&A afterwards. So I'm going to start off with who we are. And uh, the short version is that each of the three of us was a kid who grew up with the parks here, came here from young ages, whether it was from nearby. I was in Florida. These guys were from out of state. And uh, we got attached to Disney, and, and that sort of led us into creative work, and it, it informs how we go about our, our jobs today. So we start off with where Imagineering comes from, the origins of it back in, in Walt's time. So Walt Disney, we say, was uh, one of the great storytellers of the 20th century. He uh, was always looking for a new medium in which to tell his stories, whether it was animation, live action, or eventually in the theme parks. Where did you originally get the, the first notion for Disneyland? Well, it came about when my daughters were very young, and I, Saturday was always uh, Daddy's Day with the two daughters. So we'd start out and try to go someplace with, you know, different things. And I would take them to the merry ground and I took them different places. And as I'd sit there while they, uh, they rode the merry ground, did all these things, sit on a bench, you know, eating peanuts, I felt that there should be something built, some kind of a, an amusement enterprise built where that the parents and the children could uh, have fun together. So that's how Disneyland started. Well, it took many years. It was a uh, whole period of maybe 15 years developing. The, uh, I started with many ideas, threw them away, started all over again. And eventually it evolved into what you see today as Disneyland. But it all started from a daddy with two daughters wondering where he could take them, where he could have a little fun with them too. Okay, so you can see this was a very personal point of origin for Walt. He built Disneyland, I've, I've heard it said, because he wanted one. It was just something he thought he would like and, and therefore he thought other people would like. But how do you go about it? I should stop talking because I've, I've, I've started off for too long. So, um, so like Alex said, Walt wanted a Disneyland. So one of Walt's really good friends is Welton Beckett, who was in a Los Angeles architect. Has everyone here been to Los Angeles? You've seen? So at LAX, there's the theme building, which is like that flying saucer building on the big legs. So Welton Beckett designed that. So Welton, Walt's talking to Welton and he says, I want to build a Disneyland, I want to build this place. And he shows him this drawing of a train park. And Welton tells uh, Walt, because Walt was asking because he wanted to know what architects to hire. So Welton tells Walt, there are no architects that will build that for you. <laughs> architects build boxes that people go into and that's it. He goes, the people that you need are the people who are working at your studio. And so what you're going to see here, these are all people that Walt has pilfered from the Walt Disney Studio. There's people here from live action, there's people here from animation, and Welton told Walt, these are the people who can do what you want to do. They're the ones who can design these spaces to tell your stories. Walt also had a very strict policy about hiring Mormons. And that, <laughs> you moved the slide, it was all white shirts. I saw that. Yeah. You take a shot. Yeah. It's very early. You realize this is being videotaped. Don't worry, oh, he takes a lot of is. shots. Oh, Danny, the Danny's videotaping again. <laughs> Will we uh, be able to edit this just a little bit before so, it goes back what, to what, uh, Disney? What, no? Okay. One funny story about Walt is that as he was pulling these people from the studio, he was pulling live action art directors, he was pulling people like John Hench, who was an animator. This is Herb Ryman, who actually had left the studio and gone back to do live action art direction and then came back. And when people from either the studio or from the animation studio would disappear to go join WED, which is what Imagineering was called at the time, um, they refer to it as going to Cannibal Island because once those people left the studio, they were never seen again. So they just went off the wed and disappeared, and that's where they stayed. Because at the time, no studio executives had walked into wed until after Walt had passed. I mean, it was really like his personal design studio 
away from Burbank. And he owned it at first. It wasn't even a company division. He used his own money to start it up. Right. It was actually completely separate from Disney and had to be, Disney had to purchase it later, the company. Uh, because Walt wanted, um, I mean, he actually had rights to his own name at one point. And uh, the, so there was this weird negotiation where uh, at a certain point the studio absorbed WED and it, it was, that's probably not important when we're filming, I would, I would guess. <laughs> Never mind. Okay, so this image is the first actual drawing that was done for Disneyland. And the way this came about, the Herb Ryman that you saw in the previous slide got a call from Walt on a Friday afternoon. It was Saturday? It was oh, you're right, it was weekend. Oh, so, yeah, because he said, he, yeah. Herb said, where are you? And he goes, I'm at the studio. And he goes, you're working on Saturday? And he goes, yeah. well, yeah, it's my studio. I can work Saturday, <laughs> Sunday, do whatever I want. Right. So Walt goes on to tell Herbie a little bit about what he had in mind and, and uh, described this park that he wanted to build and said that he was going to New York on Monday to show the drawings to the bankers to get his financing in place and really get started building Disneyland. Um, Herbie said, I'd love to see the drawings. And Walt said, you're going to do them. And so <laughs> asked him to come into the studio on that Saturday. Herbie agreed to do it on the condition that Walt stand there over his shoulder the whole time and feed him every bit of information that he wanted to see in the drawing. So when you see this drawing, which is actually it's pretty massive uh, in, in person, um, it, it is actually really closely hewn to what Disneyland ended up being at uh, opening day the, the, in terms of the organization, the breakdown of the lands, or a few things moved around here and there, but it's, it's a, a very fair representation. It, and just to drive that home, because a, a lot of you don't have um, access to it, but when we design a park from scratch, like an Animal Kingdom or an, or an Epcot, that plan for that park changes dozens of times, and things move and lands change, and it just goes iteration, 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 and the fact that this drawing was the first one out of the gate, and for the most part, you would say, what, 85% correct, 90% correct, is, is amazing. And really goes to show you the vision that Walt had in his head and how he was able to, uh, to get it out. So it's pretty spectacular. There's Disneyland, about a year before opening. They, they, really, they built Disneyland in a year in a stretch of uh, just outside LA that was uh, obviously not very heavily populated at the time. Opening day. Lots of fanfare, lots of uh, little stumbles along the way. Autopia cars, it, was it two of them were running by the end of the first day? Yeah, yeah. and they, were they on a track initially? No, they were not. Yeah. Lesson, lessons learned along the way. <laughs> Other lessons learned. Yeah, you don't see a whole lot of that anymore. Right. Uh, initially, Walt didn't even have costumes for the characters, so these were actually borrowed from the uh, ice, capades. ice capades people who had, had costumes on hand. We very gratefully gave them back to them. <laughs> how they look. Right. <laughs> then the Florida story starts. So New York World's Fair, 1964, 1965, was a huge opportunity for Walt to try his hand on the East Coast, see if the, the Disney thing would play to a different audience, not, not centered around Hollywood necessarily. And uh, it was also a chance to try a lot of things he had in his head using other people's money. Yeah, that was a very calculated thing. I mean, his sole motivation for going to the World's Fair was to see if uh, the way he called it sophisticated East Coast audiences would appreciate Disney-style entertainment. Because uh, even going back to the animated films, a lot of the highbrow critics in New York and some of those areas you know, really looked down on Disney entertainment and thought it was kind of corny and just really geared to kids. So th this was a very calculated effort to introduce um, his kind of outdoor entertainment on the East Coast to see how it would play. And Disney had the, the four biggest shows of the fair. And the other amazing thing about, I don't know what your next, is your next slide still World's Fair? Yeah. Oh, okay. So the, the other, well, we can go through it. Okay. We can talk. The other amazing thing about the World's Fair show is that Walt was a really savvy businessman. And in the end, he got other people to pay for things that he ended up owning. So when the World's Fair was done, this show, which was a State of Illinois Pavilion, which was Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln, got shipped back to Disneyland, is still there today. Do you have all the shows in here? Uh, no. And originally it was going to be the Hall of Presidents, but the reason it wound up being just Lincoln was because they knew there was no way they could get the entire show ready in a year. And then they had their plate full already, and there was one time where UNICEF approached Disney, they, they approached uh, WED, 
and said, you know, we want you to do a show to benefit the United Nations, and it was in conjunction with Pepsi, and one of our executives actually turned him down, and when Walt heard about it, he's like, I'm the one that makes those decisions, tell Pepsi I'll do it, and that's how we got It's a Small World, and again, really within a year, I think. Of, I think that was about fair. nine months. Yep. Yeah. So, the, so the small world at Disneyland is the one from the World's Fair. Yeah. Carousel of Progress here in Walt Disney World is from the World's Fair, and has anyone been on the Disneyland train? and you go through that scene with dinosaurs, and you're probably like, why are there dinosaurs on the Disneyland train? That's from the Ford Magic Skyway Pavilion. So they salvaged what they could from that show, and then they put it on the train. And then another interesting note about that, just a total Disney geek thing, is that um, when we built Tokyo Disneyland, that's owned by a separate company, Oriental Land Company, when they came to our parks to see what, what attractions they wanted, they said they wanted the train. So we started laying out the train for them, and they said, well, where are the dinosaurs? <laughs> And we're like, really? You guys want the dinosaurs? Like, oh yeah, that's part of the train ride. That was the fun part. So they have, oddly, they have the dinosaurs on the Disneyland, Tokyo Disneyland Railroad. It's actually the Western Railroad at Tokyo Disneyland. They have the dinosaur scene, which is funny because it's a copy of a World's Fair Pavilion that we were trying to leverage just to have extra stuff. So. And it was also a chance to try out some people moving systems. He, he, you know, he knew there were going to be huge crowds at uh, the fair, and so it, the, the attractions there went way beyond the, the numbers of guests that he was ever able to carry on anything at Disneyland prior to that. So uh, Omni movers and uh, the, boat, the boat ride, that sort of thing. So yeah, that had a huge impact on two classics, because prior to the fair, um, Pirates of the Caribbean and Haunted Mansion <clears throat> were both designed to be walkthrough experiences, and the executives at Disneyland were really getting antsy about it because they knew that they were going to be very low capacity, so they were constantly pressuring Walt to make both of those experiences ride through, and it was uh, the attractions at the fair that led to, you know, the, the same boat system that was used, developed for Small World, was applied to Pirates, and then the Omnimover for Magic Skyway ultimately morphed into what would become the Doom Buggy at the Haunted Mansion, so this, the, the World's Fair is just a pivotal event in our company history on a number of levels. Right, and then Walt said, Jason and Jason moved to Florida. <laughs> now this was, uh, you know, the site selection for uh, Walt Disney World was really uh, a key decision. Lots of factors went in. He didn't, he wanted to be away from the beach, didn't want to compete with beach vacations. He wanted to be near all these different uh, intersections. The, the information I've read says that at the time he was deciding between, I think Orlando and Ocala, Ocala. were the final two options, they were about the same size of a city. And so that's kind of amazing to think that in this amount of time, things have changed the way they have. And I think part of the decision too was uh, they knew that in the Orlando area, there was kind of a crisscrossing between I-4 and the Turnpike. I yeah. think that had a, a lot to do with it. Uh, uh, one quick funny story was uh, he was also looking at St. Louis, and this is kind of a legendary story within Disney. The reason we didn't build in St. Louis, because we have plans for, I think, it, what's it called, Riverboat Square or something like that. There's this whole installation. He was at a dinner with uh, August uh, or Augustus Bush of, of Bush beer. And I guess at the dinner, the, guy, uh, the head of the Bush Brewing said, anybody who doesn't serve beer in a park is an idiot. And that was it. Walt's like, all right, we're done. <laughs> Florida, here we come. Is the camera still on? Yeah. <laughs> we'll That's hear from the Bush what's... people now. Bush and Disney. It's Not gonna die. Yeah. <laughs> so Dana Carvey fans. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Here we have uh, Magic Kingdom. That X marks the spot where the castle would be. Uh, the gentleman on the, it's the far right is Welton Beckett, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's Welton Beckett, the architect that you heard earlier. And on the left is Marty Sklar, who ended up being the creative lead for Imagineering for several decades, up until <laughs> not too long Just ago. Just recently. Yeah. And he'll actually, he's coming to town this weekend for Epcot's 30th anniversary, which is on Monday. So it's kind of a big weekend out there. You may have seen the castle. You can see it from here. Just look off to your left. <laughs> right. Okay, so all this leads to what Imagineering is today, and we have, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit, oh, I'm sorry, this is the... Many of the things that seem impossible now will become realities tomorrow. This is not Santa's workshop. Walt created Imagineering to reflect the new type of entertainment he wanted to create for Disneyland. 
Today we have Imagineers all around the world working in 140 different disciplines. Pioneering new forms of entertainment and taking you to magical places. Change all the cheese and that. This new innovation will allow our guests to see many of our attractions in a whole new light. Rummy actually likes to dance. He picks up the beat of the music and starts dancing to the music. Guests at home are playing a virtual version, riding at exactly the same time as the guests in the park. It's a real mix of science and thrill. Blending creative imagination with technical know-how. We would like our audio animatronic figures to interact with the guests, and this is a way for us to rapidly prototype this kind of interaction. By bringing our characters to life and making them very interactive, we had a very powerful effect on our guests. You're awesome, dude! He's taking real questions and talking back to kids in real time. You're awesome, dude! In the case of Wally, the real challenge was to have a performance that would make him look like the Wally robot in the movie. Wow! His eyes can zoom in and out with the lenses so he can look like he's focusing in on you. <laughs> Disney is famous for having a lot of detail, so the closer you look at something, the more you see. We hide the technology behind the show, and it has to be invisible, because at the end, people want to be entertained. Most importantly, it's not just an assembly of little pieces, but it tells one big sweeping story. The things that we do are so complex, and yet our goal is to make them look like magic to our guests. It's always amazing when you envision something in your mind and you see the thing in dimension and you see guests enjoying it. As Imagineers, our greatest challenge and our greatest delight is to tell stories. Hit me with some dust. Magical things can happen. This is where that is possible. So if it looks like fun, it usually is. Uh, here, we're going to talk a little bit about how Imagineering is broken down around the globe. So we have our main offices in Glendale, California, near our studio lot. So there's a close connection between the, the kind of heart and brain of the company out there and, and WDI's headquarters. We have the preponderance of the Imagineers are based there. Here in Florida, because of the size of Walt Disney World property, we have the largest other group. We, we are somewhere three or four hundred-ish, depending on what's going on at any given, given time. Uh, other properties, uh, Paris, Hong Kong, Tokyo, and now people building in Shanghai, uh, the, the existing site offices have something in the range of a couple of dozen maybe at each, each location to support that property on an ongoing basis, maintain show quality, support projects that are coming to the field, that sort of thing. And then uh, the next thing we're going to go through pretty quickly is what the process and the different disciplines are that participate in anything that we produce. So a lot of this, I don't know what everybody here does. I think a lot of the steps and the thought process will be familiar to you. It's just kind of broken down in a particular way with different terminology maybe uh, as applied to what we do. And a lot of it, I would say, stems from the fact that it was derived from film studio origins. Uh, so everything starts with an idea. We have blue sky brainstorming sessions where thoughts are put out on the table, decisions are made about which ones are, are valid to be pursued. Then we have uh, concept development. So this is when we take that idea and we get writers and artists and, and uh, engineers involved and they start to think about that idea, what it would take to produce it. They um, make decisions, core decisions about what the format is going to be. Is it a, is it a ride through, walk through, theater show? What, what's the delivery of the story going to be? You guys can't see the tags. So show design. So this is where we take those concepts and get a little bit more particular about methodology, material, scale, uh, start to really kind of firm up all of the things that were pretty vague and loosely described in the concept stage. What does that one say? Pre-visualization. Okay, why don't you start because you can see what <laughs> So uh, pre-visualization, which is a very hard word for me to say evidently, um, this is a process where we take these concept designs and we build them three-dimensionally in a computer. So we allow um, anybody who needs to the ability to sort of walk through a space and see what it is. And at this point, you know, we're interfacing it's not, we just don't design in a vacuum. We have constant interaction with the people who operate the park, 
whether it's food and beverage or whether it's retail or park operations, they have requirements. You know, when, when we design an attraction, you know, we have a goal for the attraction from a creative standpoint. They have a goal from an operational standpoint. So they'll say things like, well, we really need a ride in Fantasyland. We need, you know, this many people per hour in attractions, and that's why right now we're having the biggest expansion we've ever had in the Magic Kingdom. And so this pre realization stage allows us, like when we were doing Cars Land, to be able to put people down into Cars Land, let them walk through the space, see where things are, see where things look and what they look like for everybody involved in the, in the project. And as in all of our fields, the, the tools are always evolving. So this is, we're able to take the, this step much further than we could even a short time ago. Yeah, this shows someone at his computer. We actually have a room now where you can stand with full-size screens and 3D glasses and basically navigate through a space. So this one's ride engineering. And, and uh, with any kind of an attraction that has a moving vehicle to, to take the guests through, the, the ride, the aspects of the ride, the scale, the numbers of guests it can carry, all the capabilities of the vehicle, safety aspects, everything, all of that is, is really important. So this is a, actually a piece that starts very early on in the process. Rock work. This is rock work engineering. So a lot of what we do is we build um, uh, immersive environments and these things don't exist in reality. So a lot of times it involves creating landscapes and um, rock work is huge. I think when you, when New Fantasyland opens here shortly, you'll probably see outside of the Tree of Life probably the largest piece of dimensional rock work anywhere in Florida. And it all starts off with a scale model like this that we have uh, sculptors carve and then it gets scanned into a computer. The computer then breaks that surface up into individual chips which another computer then takes rebar and bends into chips, labels them and numbers them, and then we basically build the thing. It's almost like a Lego kit. The steel goes up and then it's... A very expensive Lego kit. A very kit. expensive <laughs> Lego kit. But the steel goes up and then it's chip one, chip two, chip three, chip four, chip five, and you just keep going and then you start layering concrete. And so that's a huge process for us. And one of the, one of the greatest examples of this just opened at Disney California Adventure with Cars Land. I'm sure a lot of you have seen that online. The, the rock work is absolutely stunning. And uh, it's also one of the best examples I think we've had recently of forced perspective in terms of, I mean, it looks positively vast when you stand in front of it. It just goes on and does not stop. And uh, we really take people right into to the middle of it in, in the uh, Radiator Springs Racers attraction. But I think it's one of the most convincing I illusions I think we've ever created. And, and just because, yeah, I mean, we're all creatives here. The interesting thing about this rock work is the guys who sculpt this are actually like classically trained sculpt sculptors. I mean, they're, these guys aren't messing around. They can sculpt anything. They just happen to sculpt rocks. They can sculpt anything you've ever seen before. It's amazing. Um, a lot of the fountains, decorative fountains that you'll see, our architectural ornamentation, are sculpted by the same people who also sculpt rocks. You know, so it's, it's um, you know, that whole phrase kind of dumb as rocks does, definitely does not apply to these people at all. I mean, they're, they're true artisans, absolutely true artisans. Well, even that, the rebar bending machine that he's talking about as a you know, Disney geek, this kind of thing that I don't always have exposure to fascinates me. This machine kind of, you, have you ever seen it in person? No. I know we, we, we created the process though. Yes. I mean, our guys developed the process so for this. So it, it's, it's basically all underground and there's a plate with a hole in the middle and they get the rebar in these big reels and the machine unrolls it from the reel does whatever it needs to do to manipulate it under the ground to, to shape it, and then it just kind of comes out. It's like pasta coming through a, an extruder. It's, it's really kind of fascinating to see. Okay, then show installation. So things have to go into the field. We, we bring all of these pieces together that have been uh, designed and built in different places, sometimes all around the world, and there's a lot of coordination that have, has to happen then because you can. we take these things to a pretty... Um, developed level of design, but you always find things once you put it together where you have to uh, make up ground here and there, make adjustments, uh, look for opportunities to improve upon what you even thought you were going to be able to do. Oh, show quality standards. All right. Talk show quality. Without show quality standards. He's the only standards. person that doesn't do it. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, go for it. <laughs> I walk through the park, I see things I don't like, and I complain. No, uh, show quality, we, we uh, have permanent offices at, at all of the sites around the world um, with uh, Imagineers and all the various disciplines that, that keep up with uh, the parks on a day-to-day -day basis because, um, 
you know, not everything is, is going to look the way it did on opening day, and, and our mission in that department is to ensure that it does. You know, so whether, um, you know, like a perfect example is something like Big Thunder Mountain or now Cars Land, um, both of which are just sitting there baking in the sun every day and, you know, th they'll start to fade. So uh, an example of show quality standards would be our routine, you know, repainting, um, ma making sure the, the lighting fixtures are all focused properly because we want somebody who comes to Epcot on its 30th birthday to have the same experience in Spaceship Earth as somebody did on opening day. And that's really the mission of, of the SQS department. See, he did pretty well with that. That was, that was really Nothing nice. inappropriate. I didn't make any. And lawyers would have loved that one. That story was good. <laughs> okay. So some of these are local, so you've probably heard about them. Some of them are around the world. We'll just touch really briefly. Update to Star Tours last year was a really big success. New film, new experience. Worked closely with the uh, folks at Lucasfilm and ILM to uh, update that attraction New Fantasyland in progress. You could talk about this one a little bit. Yeah, so this is um, uh, New Fantasyland. We'll be opening uh, soon, and then we'll have another phase opening later. It's the largest expansion in the Magic Kingdom in the last 40 years. It's the former site of the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea ride, if you've ever, if any of you remember that. And the cool thing about this is we're basically doubling the size of Fantasyland, which is, which is pretty amazing to think about it. It's going... I mean, don't quote me on this, but it's going somewhere from 12 acres to about almost 25 acres. Is that right? You're looking at me like that's I, wrong. I was thinking from 6 to 12, but whatever it is, it's a lot. Whatever it is, it's doubling. So it could be square feet, square meters. Exactly. It doesn't matter. Um, but uh, we'll be, uh, portions of it will be opening soon, and we're, we're, really, uh, we're really excited about it. The, the nice thing about it is it's a different look and texture for our park. The biggest thing you'll notice if you've been to the Magic Kingdom a lot is that there's going to be trees and landscaping everywhere because as, as a lot of you probably know there's tunnels underneath the magic kingdom and so once you sort of pass this castle wall that we built it's down here in the lower uh what is that left side <laughs> corner um we're off the tunnel which basically means we can plant trees and we can do all kinds of things change grades change grade there's waterfalls and rivers and bridges and and uh, chirping birds and frolicking squirrels, so it'll be it'll be a good time. Right, and portions of this have been opening up over the course of this uh, year. We're, that's correct. Yeah, we opened. Um, actually, if you want to know the real story of this project, which is really crazy, the first portion of it opened in 2010 when we redid the facade of Winnie the Pooh. Then when we put Mickey on Main Street in 2011, that was that was another phase. Because there's then a we, domino effect with all yeah, these Yeah, then things. we opened Storybook Circus earlier this spring, which is what Alex is referring to. More of that will open later. And then we have another phase opening this winter. And then we open another phase later. And then an even another phase later after that. So really this whole project, which has been really challenging, especially for all of you can imagine if you're working on a big project with multiple deadlines throughout, um, it's been it's been challenging because we've opened it basically over the course of four years. And so an, another part of the challenge is you have this massive construction site in the middle of the park. You know, it's not like a park that hasn't opened yet or um, an attraction like Splash Mountain or Big Thunder that's on the berm and kind of away from people. This is smack dab in the middle yeah. of the busiest there, land. There's a lot of logistics. Actually, the same, um, the same roadway in the back of the park that we bring all of our construction materials and all of our construction trucks and crews through is the same one that we also bring through like 800 cast members an hour. It's the same, so it's, it's really challenging. But and, and to take that idea even further, good things aren't easy. So. The, the last piece of this to open up will be the Seven Dwarfs Mine Coaster right in the center. Right. And that is truly going to become an island in the middle of an operating area so that the last two, two years or so of construction are going to be really tricky for that team to get everything they need to in there without disrupting park operations. Uh, this is just a, a piece of that, so uh, Little Mermaid, Ar Ariel's Undersea Adventure, is that the uh, official name? Under the, sea, Voyage of the Little Under the Sea, Voyage of the Little Mermaid. Okay, that's what I meant. Which Not to be confused with Voyage of the Little Mermaid at Disney's Hollywood Studios. Oh, right, right. Yes. <laughs> so You'll this, thank me this later is <laughs> when, you go to, when you go to the right park. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to help. <laughs> Uh, so this is a, a, a dark ride that we've actually, uh, we're not quite simultaneously building a, to one in California. Disney California Adventure got this attraction last year. Uh, teams are working together to bring it here as well. 
Uh, big changes to Dumbo, if you've uh, seen or heard about any of this. Two Dumbo spinners now. I mean, Dumbo is classically one of our uh, most in-demand attractions because it's kind of a rite of passage. Everybody wants to bring their kid to fly with Dumbo. Uh, but it was also historically not one of our greatest experiences from start to finish in terms of from the time you get into the line to the time you finish your, your flight. Uh, it was kind of an exposed queue, pretty slow moving because the capacity is It was, it was one of those low. things that it was a victim of its own success in that we had our youngest guests in, in some ways waiting in the longest line for what is arguably one of our shortest attractions. You know, there's a right. lot of math there that doesn't add up. And so it was just, right. it was something that needed to be addressed. And now we've, uh, you know, Alex worked on, well, you can go ahead and talk about well, that. Well, so, so it actually moved lands. It had been in Fantasyland, now becomes part of Storybook Circus. So there's kind of a, a better thematic uh, surround for Dumbo's Circus to take place. Inside the Big Top is a new queue experience that we're, we're doing for the first time where guests as part of their wait in line for Dumbo, they go into a separate space where there's a play area for kids and, and for anybody else it's an enclosed space with air conditioning and some places to sit. And it gives the, the kids something to do for a period of time uh, with a pager. So you're called back when it's, you know, the, the system keeps track of where you are in line moving toward Dumbo. So it's actually replacing some portion of your, your wait in line with a, a play space. And it's, it's so successful that children like mine don't necessarily want to go on the ride, they just want to go play in the playground. That was our intention. Yeah, so. Okay, uh, less recent but still kind of notable, um, World of Color at California Adventure. This was part of a pretty massive overhaul of that entire park that's taken place over the last few years. Um, this was their big nighttime uh, show. I think they run it three times a night now because it's uh, really kind of pulled pretty amazing uh, demand from the guests. It's massive too. The those nozzles that you see, that's probably this. This is a portion of it, but that's probably not too far off from being the size of a football field. Uh, the the whole bed that this takes place on is like one and a half or two times the size of a football field. So it's, it's and it and it all kind of uh, raises and drops uh, for different times. Of the it's day. outrageous. I yeah. mean, that's the only way you can think of describing it. It's right. just when we heard about the show before when they were designing it. We were there's like that's the most outrageous thing you've ever heard that right. you know. And one of our creative executives was out there looking at the construction and he, he saw this field of nozzles and the big pumps that were gonna feed him and everything. And he looked at you know what was then an empty pool that, that uh, in Paradise Pier there where this was gonna sit, and he goes, Man, I hope there's enough water here. <laughs> the whole thing's just gonna blow up in the air when they turned it on. Okay, Cars Land. You can talk about that. Yeah, Cars Land is uh, kind of the centerpiece of the reimagining of, of Disney California Adventure. And uh, like we mentioned earlier, it's probably one of the single most immersive environments we've ever created. And uh, it, it's also, it, it, it really um, appeals to our core audience, you know, which is families with, with younger kids. And, you know, Cars is obviously huge with, with boys. And, and this gives you an opportunity to literally step into the movie. And when you walk into... Radiator Springs. I mean, I've been out there a couple times where I've heard more than one uh, kid ask their parents, "Oh, is this where they filmed the movie?" You know, it's that convincing. And uh, the the attraction is absolutely incredible. It uses the same ride system as Test Track here at uh, Epcot, um, but it introduces a racing component. So you know, you get to. It starts off with this kind of leisurely drive through um, through the. Uh, Radiator Springs area and then you go into town and it becomes kind of a dark ride and you meet all the characters and then you get ready for the big race and at that point two of the ride vehicles kind of pull up right next to each other so the last, you know, the act three of the ride is, is a race with the car next to you and it's just exhilarating and we, we've had waits of about, we've been averaging about four hour waits this summer and it's it's really um, turned the entire park around and also um, not to lose sight of the fact that uh, we have a new entrance to California Adventure now called Buena Vista Street so it's kind of a counterpoint to Main Street if Main Street was kind of the Midwestern uh, area that Walt would have grown up on. Uh, Buena Vista Street is Los Angeles in the 1920s when he first arrived there to begin his career. And it really immerses the guests in, in the Los Angeles of the 20s and 30s. Um, richly detailed environments and, and we're finding that not only is it a great setup for the story that folks are about to experience in California Adventure, but it's, the, it's really an inviting environment that you want to 
just relax in and spend time in and grab a bite to eat. And we, we, you know, we have a lot of uh, shops um, on that street. And it, it really um, makes a strong statement as you get into the park and kind of sets you up for the experience you're about to have. And I just looked at my watch. I think we're going to need to skim through these last couple really quickly because we meant to save more time for Q&A. Uh, also big expansion at Hong Kong Disneyland. All the work you see to the left side of the train berm that runs around the park now is uh, three new lands that have been added. Uh, the last last of the three is just on the verge of opening up now, right? The uh, myst Mystic, it's that, okay, Mystic, point, Mystic yeah. Manor. Um, okay, those are the, the three lands. Uh, new original attractions in, definitely in the Grizzly, uh, Grizzly Gulch and, and Mystic Point areas. Okay, new resort at uh, Alani, we call it in Hawaii, is a new kind of destination vacation club, Disney resort that's uh, one of the first, it's the first one we've done of this scale that is not kind of pretty closely attached to our, one of our theme parks. Um, Disney Art of Animation Resort just opened up on property. It's uh, you know, filling a demand for a different type of uh, package for the, the rooms. It's a kind of a double size family suite kind of setup for most of that resort, tying, tying it to the uh, animated films over the years. And uh, we also build ships, and this is something I'm, I'm always fascinated with because when I go on those ships, I'm just amazed at all of the principles, all the things we've been talking about uh, being applied to something that has to float around. And I mean, you see the ships go through their paces over the course of a week. I'm just, I'm just stunned at what they do functionally with all the show that we try to bring to it as well. And I think that might be my last. Okay, that's it. So with that, we should stop babbling and ask for questions. But don't ask him about Luxembourg. <laughs> Not with the camera on. <laughs> we'll tell you later. It is a great story. It's just a, a little funny one. It's, Uh, she asked what roles each of I'm a senior show writer and show director. So um, on the Imagineering side, I, I do a lot of, most of my work is at the conceptual level, like coming out of those blue sky sessions, I'll actually go write the treatment that tries to get the story down on paper so that all of the disciplines are actually write, uh, working literally off the same page. Um, and then anything written, you know, scripts, spiels for some of the guided tours and live stuff. Um, I name things, you know, uh, copy for the posters and all the things that go into the parks. Um, in some of our galleries, like the AFI showcase at the studio or some of the galleries in the World Showcase countries, I'll write all the plaque copy that goes with the artifacts. So literally any and everything written. And then on the live entertainment side, I write and direct uh, live shows and events and stuff like that. I'm a show designer, which I always tell people is everything except what you think when you first hear it, because it doesn't have anything to do with the live shows. You know, Jason referenced, we, we have a different department that does live entertainment parades and, and stage shows. Uh, what show re refers to in my title is the broader Disney definition of show, all the things that a guest comes in contact with. So on a day-to-day -day basis, that can encompass anything from a little bit of architecture, a little bit of industrial design, a little bit of theatrical set design, and uh, here in Florida, we have the benefit, I think, of typically staying closer to our projects uh, from start to finish because of the size of our group. And, and we have to kind of wear multiple hats. So I also get to work as a production designer and art director as things are being built and installed. So it's, uh, it's really kind of a start to finish uh, visual development and, and story kind of discipline. And uh, I basically do the same thing Alex does. My title is concept designer. So my drawings are sloppier than his are, <laughs> typically. Yeah, yeah. They are. <laughs> they are. It's true. Um, but it's the same thing as Alex does. You know, I uh, work up front on generating ideas for attractions, work with writers like Jason, and, and, then, um, and then lately, the last few years, I've been a project art director. So then once those ideas get firmed up, then art directed the disciplines through the process all the way I into the field. So um, we, we, Alex and I kind of have a hybrid role so in that we design and art direct. So. Sorrel doesn't draw, though. I don't draw. Yeah. Okay. So, we get a little bit of what you do now. What can you give us like a snapshot of your road to be a mentor, to be a part of this? Like, when did you went to school? Where did you went to school? 
Oh, okay. Just kind of like your he went to school for the ladies. No, okay. Um, <laughs> look at him. Come on. He's a prima donna. <laughs> Anyways. Um, Thank you. Um, no, I went to school. So, um, oh, here we go. There will be a meal break. <laughs> no, I'll be really quick. So ever since I was a kid, I loved Disney. But I didn't know people designed the parks, so I always thought I was going to be an animator. So then when I was in college, I, you know, we came to the parks a couple times as a kid, and I was obsessed and totally blown away with this idea of dimensional storytelling, that you could go into environments and see things, right? And it, and it was always about, to me, it was like, how can I fool someone to think everything's real, right? That was my big thing. So when I went to college, I made my first trip back here in 10 years, and everything kind of snapped in my head, like, oh, well, this is what I've been doing all the time with my drawings. And, and um, it kind of reignited that thing. So I switched schools. I was a graphic design major. Visual communication is what I did. And then, um, but I interned at the Field Museum in Chicago as an exhibit designer. I told them I don't want to do graphic design. I want to do environmental design because I want to learn how to build these places. So um, I interned there for a year. They hired me for a year. And then during that year, I interviewed at Imagineering. And uh, my senior project in college, I built a preview center for a knockoff Magic Kingdom park with rides and all this stuff. So. Then a year out of school, they hired me down here in Florida. Interviewed in California a few times, and they said, we want people in Florida, so, so I said, so here I am. Mine's kind of similar, except I figured out when I was about eight that people designed the parks. I was, we always say he's the smart one, <laughs> and this is why. We all move at different paces. Yes. <laughs> it's all good. I was like, look at the pretty pictures. Yeah. Um, so, but the, the trick was figuring out what to study, and this was obviously years ago before the internet, before there were as many books about Imagineering. Uh, there weren't a lot of resources to find out, so I kind of went through school trying to find my way and without any better idea because my dad was a mechanical designer and is a mechanical designer and when we used to come down here even from the time I was a little kid part of what fascinated me about it was how it worked the nuts and bolts what's going on behind the scenes and so we would literally spend half an hour in a queue doing napkin sketches of what we had seen on the previous attraction and so I started off in mechanical engineering in college did a couple years of all the pre-engineering work all the stuff calculus and chemistry and physics and everything that I would end up not really needing later. Um, but, but there was, you know, design communication was an aspect of that. Then I switched into architecture. I could tell that was closer, but still wasn't quite right. But I took a lot from the architectural design studio and materials and methods of construction, architectural history. I ended up from that having thoughts to put together my own curriculum. So I, I went to the interdisciplinary committee at school and said, I wanted to study this, 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 and this. And I kind of went through the whole course catalog for the entire university and put, added to those previous two bits um, from the art school, some foundation, you know, drawing, color, composition, history kind of classes. And then the big piece at the end was theatrical set design, so scenic production, theatrical history. And so I got that approved, which took some legwork and took me five years to get through. But I needed a more focused skill set to get me in the door somewhere. So I went to grad school and studied set design for theater at uh, California Institute of the Arts outside of LA. So that's kind of how I got in. And then it was knocking on doors and using connections through school to um, get a hold of somebody at WDI and get in the door. Um, I actually started out in live entertainment. Um, my degree is in liberal arts, which is patently worthless. But you, <laughs> but you, I had always... you started in business, didn't you? Yeah, I, well, I was originally going to go to film school. And then um, it, during my high school years, I, I became, it, that, those were like the, the height of the Eisner Wells years at Disney. So I kind of rethought it a little bit and, and thought, oh, I want to I be in entertainment, but I want to run something. So I actually started out in business school and then started at Disney on the college program at the Jungle Cruise and then wound up transferring down here to finish up school and work at Disney at the same time. And literally within a month of getting down here, um, I was a performer at Epcot. And one of the guys I worked with said, hey, you seem to be a, be a pretty good writer. I have an idea for a character Christmas show. Do you want to work on it with me? And I said, sure. You know, I didn't. I was 21 years old, had no idea that hourly employees just didn't do that. But we pitched it, and it wound up working its way up through the approval process and got produced. So I, at age 21, I was standing out in World Showcase Plaza listening to Mickey Mouse say things that I had written. And that was pretty much it. So I just kept kind of pitching those extracurricular ideas and over the course of two or three years it got to the there were enough of them that if you looked at my resume it really looked like I knew what I was doing and um, I used that as a springboard to get a job over at Universal Studios where I spent five years um, doing Halloween Horror Nights and um, I wrote the Barney show that's still running over there and I wrote the script toward the end of my time there for Jurassic Park I love you <laughs> yeah. 
I remember my wife one, one time came home from work and I was sitting in front of the TV with Barney on, going, we're on our way, we're on our way, on our way to grandpa's farm. And she's like, divorce. Um, <laughs> And uh, toward the end of that time, I wrote the script for Jurassic Park River Adventure at Islands of Adventure, and that e-ticket experience was what enabled me to get hired at Imagineering, and I've been there ever since. Bill and Ted, too, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I um, originated the, the Bill and Ted show that runs at Halloween, um, so that was cool. I did five of the, wrote and directed five of those kind of during the, the heyday, um, 94 through 98. I was the one who got O.J. Simpson and the White Bronco out on stage, and uh, it's been downhill ever since. I have a great ego story. I remember one time we were on a project yes. and, hey, I'm talking. No, no, but it's a good point because uh, I, I was making the argument that the position that I was advocating was objective and I, my motives were pure. I said, you know, because I don't have an ego about this stuff. And Tom Fitzgerald, who we saw in the Imagineering video, looked at me and goes, we all have egos here. If we didn't, we wouldn't think that our ideas are worth spending hundreds of millions of dollars to build. And I went, oh, fair point. <laughs> I would say um, in a big company, it's a little different. And, and uh, again, I don't know where all you guys come from. Some of you are probably in different, I mean, different sized companies, I'm sure. Here at, at Disney, part of the trick is figuring out how to get things through the pipeline, how to convince people that your idea is worth putting resources behind, how to understand what the company might be looking for. Uh, and whenever anything happens, or the thing you realize from being out there for a while, it's so big and there's so many stakeholders, so many people who have to weigh in on a, a project or an idea from so many different angles because, you know, like Jason referenced all the operators and the food and beverage people and maintenance and, you know, there's all these things that you have to, to account for. So all the stars have to align for anything to move forward. And I think you just have to, as a creative person working in that environment, you have to understand that and accept it to a point, but the, that means your job is to understand what the given parameters are, do everything you can to improve the creative quality of it, and, and push for that all the time. And I used to, when I was in art school, I used to hear from people who knew what I wanted to do, you know, why do you want to work for Disney? Why do you want to work in theme parks? And for me, it was, as a medium, I thought it was interesting that we get to build things that last as long as they do and that so many people get to see and that kind of take a place within the pop culture landscape and, and you know, um, understanding that people have of, of, of what, the, what Disney is. Um, but then there's also the ego side. You have to understand that you're not always going to get your way, but it's because we have a big company, resources, people to throw at things that we're able to, to do things that are bigger than any of us could do on our own. So, so to me, that's, that's all part of the puzzle and it's part of the challenge and interest of it is, is trying to just do everything you can to improve it along the way. And, and this, they're, they're gonna laugh at me at this example that I'm gonna give, but you know, we recently brought back the orange bird in Magic Kingdom. Oh, dear God. No, no, okay, see, thank you. So it's funny because people look at that and like, okay, well, you put a little orange bird on a fruit crate on a shelf and a walk up I'm only amazed right. that it took this long for you to talk and about it. And I haven't like, mentioned, oh, I did. He, he mentioned Chicago. I did mention Chicago. Yeah. Chicago okay. got Bing. out there quick. So um, people look at that and go, oh, you put this little orange bird up, big deal, right? The, the reality is it took almost 40 people to do that. When you, when you look at everything. That bird's heavier than you think. The, yeah, it's really it is. <laughs> But the, the reality is to bring the orange, get the orange bird back and do the shirts and do the, all these things took about 40 people. And, and so... Like Alex said, you have to learn how to navigate the system. And, and the other thing at, at Imagineering that Marty, that we talked about, Marty Sklar, who was in that photo walking the, with the X on the ground, Marty always says this one, one thing. He always says, there's only one name on the door, and it's Walt Disney. And that's it. That's the end of the story. We are all here servicing that. Because in the end, when our guests come on, uh, when they're going to ride Little Mermaid soon, th this is a singular expression that's taken three, four, five hundred people to create, you know, and, and we we're all doing it just so people can go on this great attraction and have a great time. And so 
Um, everyone has a role in the show that we, we, we like to say that. And sometimes your role is to be a cheerleader and to cheerlead people on. And your role can be to guide people or your role can be to step back and support people however you can so that they can get done what they're trying to get done. And, and the key is to know when to do any of those things at what time to do them. So. And, and within this kind of collaborative corporate environment, there is room for fine art. I mean, John Hench, Herb Ryman, a lot of the original Imagineers and certainly a lot of the artists we have working today are fine artists that have chosen to work in this medium. And like, I got into it um, not only because I always had an Imagineering dream, but because our um, craft derives from filmmaking, you know, which is something I'd always wanted to do. So for me, it, it's kind of the best of all worlds. And, and we get to leave something behind that we know is going to be there for uh, decades in some cases. Mm -hmm.